Peripheral vascular disease. A case with peripheral vascular disease may present with a gangrene where cell death has already occurred or before that with an ischemic limb. If gangrene be present, then examine the gangrenous area first and then proceed to examine the ischemic limb. Now we begin our examination with the inspection of the affected limb. On inspection of the gangrenous area, it shows a dark discoloration and a shriveled up mummified appearance if it is a dry gangrene. Note the dry, shriveled up appearance of the dry gangrene of this right foot and leg. A wet gangrene, as seen in the fingers of the right hand, shows black discoloration, but the tissues are edematous and swollen and there is no clear cut demarcation between the gangrenous and the normal limb. In comparison, the dry gangrene shows a line of demarcation between the dead gangrenous part and the normal living limb as seen in this leg. Note the well differentiated line of demarcation between the gangrene and the proximal healthy tissue in this dry gangrene of the finger. Just proximal to the line of demarcation is a small zone of hyperemia and hyperesthesia followed by normal skin. This is another case of a dry gangrene of the index finger. It is in the process of separation. In due course of time, the dry gangrene will separate itself by the process of aseptic ulceration and the ulcer will be covered up by skin. Now inspect the proximal limb for evidence of proximal spread of gangrene and infection and for evidence of chronic ischemia. First we look for proximal spread of the gangrene. Presence of redness and edema in the proximal skin suggests active infection as in a wet gangrene. The skin may show blebs, ulceration and black colored skip areas suggesting proximal spread of the gangrene. This bleb proximal to the gangrenous toe indicates a spreading gangrene. Redness, edema and slough around the site of amputation of a gangrenous toe indicate infection and wet spreading gangrene. Note the black colored skip areas in the palm suggesting proximal spread of the gangrene. Skip areas are areas of blackening in the proximal limb independent from the gangrene. Next we look for signs of chronic ischemia. Observe the skin color of the ischemic limb and compare it with the opposite normal side. Note the blackish dark discoloration in the right limb suggesting chronic ischemia. A marked pallor will indicate sudden arterial obstruction as in embolism or during Raynaud's phenomenon. Note the pale white appearance of the left hand in this case of left axillary artery embolism. A chronically ischemic limb looks pale and thin. The skin over the lower part of the leg and shin is thin and shiny with scanty hair. The leg is thin due to loss of subcutaneous fat and muscle wasting. The nails are brittle with transverse ridges. As the blood supply becomes critically less, the distal parts of the fingers and toes become darker in color and the tips of the fingers or toes may show ischemic or trophic ulcers. Once again, note the ischemic leg on the left side which is darker than the normal right leg and has a wasted shriveled up appearance. Now measure the limb girth with a measuring tape and compare it with the girth of the opposite limb at the same level to demonstrate and record limb wasting. The measurements are taken over the main muscle mass about 3 inches above and below the knee joint in the lower limbs and 2 inches above and below the elbow joint in the upper limbs. Now inspect the veins over the dorsum of the foot. If they are well filled in the lying down position, it indicates a fairly good circulation. But if they are collapsed and gutter like, then it is an indication of severe ischemia. If the patient has had an amputation before, like this toe amputation, 
or if ischemia is long standing look for a scar of lumbar sympathectomy a transverse lumbar scar at the level of umbilicus lastly if the toes are affected look for a constriction at the base of the toe as seen in einham note the constriction of the base of the fifth toe which gradually deepens over several years till the toe separates to revise first inspect the gangrenous area note the extent of the gangrene the line of demarcation and the type of gangrene whether dry or wet then examine the proximal limb for evidence of infection that is edema and redness for evidence of spread of gangrene that is blebs ulcerations and skip areas and evidence of chronic ischemia thin shiny skin with scanty hair wasting and brittle nails with transverse ridges now let us proceed to palpation on palpation first palpate the gangrenous area in a dry gangrene the skin is cold non tender hard and greasy it has no sensations in a wet gangrene the skin is turgid edematous with loss of sensations but it may be tender if gangrene is not fully established if the skin is edematous palpate carefully all over the gangrenous and proximal area for crepitations to rule out an anaerobic infection like gas gangrene now palpate the ischemic proximal limb first test the temperature of the skin with the back of your fingers proceeding proximally and comparing with the temperature of the opposite leg at the same level note the level up to which the limb is cold in a severe peripheral vascular disease it may be cold up to the mid thigh skin temperature is a good indicator of the state of skin circulation and is important in deciding the level of amputation if required now palpate the gangrenous and proximal limb for tenderness next palpate along the lines of major vessels for tenderness that is along the popliteal and femoral arteries in the lower limbs and radial brachial and axillary arteries in the upper limbs tenderness indicates recent thrombosis or embolism note the tenderness along the course of the axillary artery in this case of axillary artery embolism now we will proceed to focal examination that is examination of arteries lymph nodes and the joints first palpate the arterial pulse at various levels in all the limbs then palpate the inguinal region for enlargement of lymph nodes and then test the movements of different joints in the gangrenous area gangrenous portion of the limb will lose its movements as seen in the right foot and ankle and left toes now we shall study in details the method of palpation of the pulsations of the arterial tree at various levels to note the state of arterial circulation first test the capillary circulation in the nails blanch the nail by pressing its tip release the pressure and note the time taken by the nail bed to turn pink again it gives a rough idea of the rate of blood flow in the capillaries then palpate the dorsalis pedis artery at the proximal end of the first metatarsal space just lateral to the tendon of extensor hallucis longus against the navicular and middle cuneiform bones palpate the posterior tibial artery midway between medial malleolus and tendo achilles against the calcaneum keeping the foot dorsiflexed and inverted if dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial are well felt and normal it implies that the proximal pulses are bound to be normal next palpate the popliteal artery in the popliteal fossa against the upper end of tibia or lower end of femur with the patient in supine position keep the knee flexed to 135 degrees keep your thumbs over the tibial tuberosity and insinuate the fingertips in the lower part of the popliteal fossa palpating from the lateral to medial side till the neurovascular bundle is felt 
now palpate the artery against the upper end of tibia if not felt in this position turn the patient prone flex the knee to 90 degrees and palpate the artery in the midline in the upper part of the popliteal fossa against the lower end of femur if the popliteal pulse is still not felt as it is a very difficult pulse to locate in obese patients then perform the fushik's test or crossed legs test fushik's test ask the patient to sit on the edge of the table and cross the affected leg so that the popliteal fossa rests on the opposite knee ask him to keep the leg fully relaxed divert his attention into talking something else and look for oscillatory movements of the hanging leg synchronous with the patient's pulse note the oscillations of the foot in this boy with gangrene due to electric burns who has a normal popliteal pulse while in this patient of burger's disease absence of oscillatory movements suggests that the popliteal artery pulsations are absent the test is of great significance when femoral pulse is normal but dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial are not palpable because presence of these oscillatory movements is a definite indication of a good popliteal pulse for the femoral artery with the patient lying supine keep the leg slightly abducted and externally rotated to relax the deep fascia and palpate in the line of mid inguinal point just below the inguinal ligament femoral artery is felt against the head of femur then palpate the abdominal aorta to the left of the midline in epigastric and umbilical areas against the spine now palpate the pulsations in the opposite limb and then pulsations in the upper limbs from periphery to the neck let us now learn to palpate the pulsations in the upper limbs at various levels start at the nails to test the capillary circulation by pressing the nail tip till it blanches and noting the time taken by the nail bed to turn pink again palpate the radial artery on the flexor aspect of the wrist just lateral to the tendon of flexor carpi radialis against the lower end of radius then palpate the brachial artery in the lower half of the arm just medial to the biceps tendon against the shaft of the humerus and in front of the elbow medial to the biceps tendon palpate the axillary artery in the axilla against the head of humerus palpate the subclavian artery in the supraclavicular fossa in mid clavicular line against the first rib then palpate the common carotid artery against the cassegnis tubercle on the transverse process of sixth cervical vertebra between the upper portion of the trachea and sternomastoid other palpable arteries of course they are not of significance in a case of peripheral vascular disease are superficial temporal artery and the facial artery superficial temporal artery is palpated in front of the tragus against the temporal bone and facial artery is felt against the lower border of the mandible at the anterior border of masseter muscle ask the patient to clench his teeth palpate the masseter and identify its anterior border now we proceed to auscultation after palpation of the arteries you will know the approximate level of the block now auscultate along the entire course of the artery for a systolic bruit of stenosis partial obstruction or aneurysm also routinely auscultate over the major arteries that is abdominal aorta femorals popliteals axillary artery and carotids now we will come to some special tests for peripheral vascular disease tests for lower limbs the burger's test ask the patient to lie supine and raise the leg knees extended to about 90 degrees if the limb shows marked pallor then the test is positive note the pale white color of the right foot when it is raised the pallor appears within a few seconds in a severe disease 
and may take 2 to 3 minutes in a mild disease. If the test is positive, lower the limb, let it resume the normal color, then raise it gradually to note the angle at which the pallor appears. This angle of the leg with the horizontal is termed as Berger's angle of circulatory insufficiency. Berger's angle less than 30 degrees is indicative of very severe ischemia. Note that in this patient, the pallor has appeared at an angle of 30 degrees. Now we will test the capillary filling time. With the patient supine, raise the legs till the affected leg becomes pale. Now ask the patient to sit on the edge of the examination table and hang the legs down. Note the time taken by the affected leg to resume its normal pink color. This is the capillary filling time and in peripheral vascular disease it may be prolonged to 15 to 30 seconds. Now let the patient sit with the legs hanging for 2 to 3 minutes. The leg will assume a purple red cyanotic color termed as dependent rubor indicating impaired circulation. A normal healthy limb will not show any change in color in raised as well as dependent position. Now we will come to some special tests for examination of chronic ischemia in the upper limbs. The Raynaud's phenomenon. If you are suspecting Raynaud's phenomenon, dip the fingers of both hands in ice cold water and watch for blanching or pallor of the fingers. If the fingers become blanched, take the hands out of the cold water. The fingers will become swollen and cyanosed and gradually as the spasm of the arteries wears off, they become red and engorged due to flow of blood in the dilated capillaries. Then perform the tests for thoracic outlet syndrome. Adson's test With the patient sitting on a stool, feel the radial pulse of the affected hand. Ask the patient to turn the face as much as possible towards the affected side. Ask him to take a deep breath. If the pulse becomes feeble or is obliterated, then the Adson's test is positive. The forced inspiration contracts the scalenus anterior, which is an accessory muscle of respiration, which elevates the first rib and compresses the subclavian artery at the thoracic outlet. The test is also performed by asking the patient to turn the neck to the opposite side and to take a deep breath. And secondly, by keeping the arm extended and pulling it downwards, noting whether the pulse diminishes. Elevated Arms Stress Test Ask the patient to abduct the shoulders to 90 degrees with maximum possible external rotation, keeping elbows flexed at 90 degrees, thus raising the arms above the head. Now ask the patient to brace the shoulders back and open and close the fists slowly for a period of 3 minutes. If the patient's symptoms of radiating pain, cramps, paresthesia or Raynaud's phenomenon appear, forcing him to stop, then the test is considered as positive for thoracic outlet obstruction. A normal individual will only feel some fatigue in the forearm muscles. Lastly, we will perform the Allen's test for the degree of patency of radial and ulnar arteries. Ask the patient to clench his fists tightly. Now compress both radial and ulnar arteries at the wrist separately using both your hands. Ask the patient to clench and release the fist till blanching occurs. Now ask him to open the fist and release the radial artery. Note the time taken by the hand to regain the normal pink color. Then repeat the test and after blanching the hand, release the ulnar artery and note the time taken by the hand to regain normal color. If any of the arteries is blocked, the palm will remain blanched for a longer time when pressure over the blocked artery is released. To conclude, we started the examination of a case of ischemic limb 
with a careful inspection of the gangrene and the ischemic limb. Then we examined the arteries, lymph nodes and the movements. We palpated the arterial pulse at various levels and auscultated over it for a brui. Lastly, we performed the special tests for peripheral vascular disease. In the lower limb, we performed the Berger's test and capillary filling time. In the upper limb, Raynaud's phenomenon, Erson's test, elevated arms stress test and Allen's test. This completes the study of examination of a case of peripheral vascular disease.